Okay, so we are recording now. And what I have here is a problem given to me by a student asking about a situation in which you have a penguin in a box, which we can treat as a point mass, on a slope. And this slope has some friction, uh, either kinetic or static, depending on whether it's moving or not. And the question is asking us uh, three parts. Uh, and they're all asking about <clears throat> what is the uh, minimum force or what is the required force in order to stop it, stop the object from slipping, um, start it moving, and uh, get it to move up the ramp at constant velocity. So it's been a little bit while uh, for the time since I've explained these things, but I think I should hopefully still be able to explain it intuitively. So the very first idea here is what is the minimal uh, force parallel to stop the plane from slipping? I think the idea here is that in a situation like this, force of friction will be working sort of, um, it'll be working, essentially speaking, on your side, right? It's basically saying that if force of friction wasn't there, and let's say that maybe um, your force also wasn't there, uh, gravity if gravity alone was acting on it, it, the object would sort of slide downhill because force of gravity has a uh, downwards parallel component, uh, or co parallel component pointing down the slope. So in that sense, force of friction is going to be pointing upwards, sort of, uh, sort of stopping it from slipping downwards, and it's asking how much more force do you need to apply to get it to stop moving? Now, maybe a force of friction, if uh, mu static was large enough, and yes, we are using mu static here because I think the idea is it's not moving. Um, and how much force do you need to apply to keep it from not moving? But the idea here is uh, st uh, the kinetic, sorry, the static force of friction is helping you out because it's pointing upwards and it's saying, how much extra work do you need to do? So with that in mind, we're sort of saying, setting up a Newton's second equation in the parallel direction to be F, the force you apply, plus force of friction minus mg cosine theta. Excuse me, uh, what is this? This should probably be mg sine theta, right? Because if this is theta, uh, the parallel direction is this one over here. So yeah, it's sine theta. And the idea here is that if it's at rest and needs to continue to be at rest, the acceleration needs to be zero. So I'm just writing F is equal to ma, uh, summing up all the forces. So this is the force we apply. This is force of friction, which we can calculate from uh, the normal force. And then mg sine theta is what gravity contributes. So just looking at this right now, um, you can kind of see that if force of friction gets larger, right? That's basically mu, <clears throat> I think it's mg cosine theta. If mu of static got really, really large, like let's say that you put duct tape onto the bottom of the uh, object, it's sort of saying that as this thing gets larger, then F gets smaller, right? Like you don't have to do as much work if this thing is stickier and stickier and has more and more friction, right? And as force of friction oops, uh, gets large enough, it sort of counteracts mg sine theta uh, almost entirely on its own. But if the force of friction isn't that large, then you have to do more work. And uh, the reason I sort of bring this up is because I think it sort of helps us keep in mind what's happening in part B. So that was part A. And in part B, what's going to happen here is, what is the minimum F that will start the sled moving? Okay, so it actually took me a moment to remember what exactly is being asked here. And uh, I can explain it intuitively, though. Um, so what it's saying is, whereas in the first part of the problem, force of friction was sort of um, helping you out by keeping it from slipping, right? Force of friction is kind of a, kind of a fickle beast. Um, it will try to oppose whatever the... Uh, motion would have otherwise been without it, I think is probably the intuitive way to explain it. But the idea is, um, the idea is it's not necessarily on your side. Um, if you're trying to push it and pushing it harder, eventually what sort of happens is, although, uh, you know, if you weren't pushing, uh, it would try to oppose the falling downwards. But if you do start pushing, it, the idea is it kind of gets smaller and smaller and smaller until it starts pointing in the opposite direction. Uh, let's get rid of that. Ugh, shoot. Wow, everything just goes away, huh? Hold on. 
Man, that's super lame. So the idea is force of friction starts pointing in the uh, opposite direction, because as you start pushing harder and harder, the dominant motion sort of would have been pushing upwards, and friction will try to oppose you. So basically, the idea is that force of friction is pointing downwards now. So the second part of the problem isn't really all that different. It's just sort of saying, whereas before you could have solved for uh, F in this equation, now it's sort of saying with force of friction being uh, downwards opposing you, now F has got to be bigger because it's trying to fight against both. It's trying to fight against both the component of gravity and also force of friction that's trying to stop it, right? You can kind of see just from the, the, uh, the comparison between the, these two equations that this F has got to be bigger than this F. Um, gosh, I wonder if this is an intuitive enough explanation, right? Um, I, I want to explain this a little with maybe a little bit more intuitive with maybe just a refrigerator uh, that's just sitting on a regular surface with friction and maybe like a small cat or something like pushing against it right and the idea is the small cat isn't very strong so um let's put it this way at rest this thing has just no forces acting on it in the horizontal direction all it has is gravity and uh, the normal force so what happens now if a small uh, cat or a mouse or something is pushing against it it's gonna apply a tiny bit of force in this direction, but uh, force of friction is gonna oppose that. It's force of friction sort of rises up to the occasion, right? Um, assuming that this thing isn't moving yet because the cat simply just isn't strong enough and it's only opposing a small force, like, I don't know, let's say 10 Newtons. Um, force of friction is just gonna rise up to the occasion and match it exactly to be 10 Newtons, right? Uh, the, the idea I'm trying to get across here that force of friction is can sort of like uh, vary both in magnitude and direction up to a certain limit, right? Now, let's say instead of a small cat, now it's like a like a big dog or something, right? And now it's applying 20 newtons, still not enough to make the fridge move uh, because force of friction, uh, we're assuming that the kinetic friction is reasonably strong and uh, still opposes it, right? So the idea is, you know, up to a certain amount, uh, it won't start moving. Uh, but now let's say that you have a human coming in. Let's say that you have a human actually coming in to push it, right? And the human can maybe apply 100 newtons of force. And let's say that this is more than whatever the uh, threshold for uh, kinetic fr uh, static friction is. Let's say the threshold was, you know, only like up to 50 or something. It's basically, what that means is basically uh, the maximum friction is only uh, 50, right? So you can kind of see in this case, friction is always opposed to this force. Uh, because it's sort of on a flat plane. Uh, but the point that I'm trying to make here is that the uh, is that the friction can very much um, vary depending on, you know, it's sort of like this dynamic thing. It varies depending on the context. And in this problem over here, it can vary not only in uh, it can vary not only in magnitude, but also in direction. So starting off in this situation over here, where the force is very small, so that if friction didn't exist, the entire the thing would have been sliding downwards. In this scenario, in situation A, friction would have uh, been helping you out because it tries to sort of resist the motion or resist the uh, acceleration between the two objects. But when in part B, you know, you go from so if I don't know what the best way to represent this, but if uh, friction goes from small to large. The idea is that as you sort of push harder and harder and harder, right? Uh, as you push harder and harder, the force of friction gets smaller, 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 until some point at which it doesn't do anything at all at zero, where your force and the uh, gravity are perfectly balancing, balancing out. But then it starts going the other direction where it starts getting more and more negative, right? And the question is basically saying, uh, during this entire threshold, it's not moving, right? When force of friction is sort of changing from one direction to the other. But once it reaches that maximum threshold on the other side, um, because your force gets larger and larger, at some point, you're going to win out against both friction and gravity. And part B is sort of saying, OK, um, you know, what, what is that threshold? Wow, that was a lot of words. But uh, the reason I wanted to make the fridge analogy was also to talk about part C a little bit, because 
it's a little bit confusing, but it's saying, what is min f required to move sled up plane at constant velocity? And this might seem a little bit confusing at first because um, so far in parts uh, a and b, we're using the static friction coefficient in both of them. But for part c, uh, the idea here is intuitively, if you've ever moved a fridge before, you sort of, you know, it's very heavy and you sort of start trying to like push it, right? And once you, you know, it's not very easy to get it going with that initial shove, right? But once it starts going, it's a little bit easier to keep it going. And this sort of, you know, this intuitively is represented by this heuristic that the coefficient of kinetic friction tends to be smaller than the coefficient of static friction. And what this is saying that once an object has started moving, right, once it gets over that initial hump, which is the large uh, static friction coefficient, making it continue move, making it continue move is easier, right? You don't need to push quite as hard to keep it in moving. And what this means is basically after you've got it start move, once you've got it started to, excuse me, once you've got it to start moving, like in part B, where your force was just big enough to overcome both the force of gravity and I'll write it mu s mg cos theta. In part C, now it's sort of asking, all right, now that you've got it start moving, can you relax the force a little bit? And yeah, you can, because now it's in order to keep it moving at a constant. Uh, in order to keep it moving at a constant acceleration, the equation, uh, excuse me, not a constant acceleration, a zero acceleration, constant velocity, the equation looks almost identical. And at a glance, you kind of wonder to yourself, wait, what the heck? This looks exactly like part B. I'm going to get the exact same answer, right? Well, no, because this part over here is now going to be mu k mg cos theta. And intuitively, again, what this means is that uh, the force that you need to keep it going at a constant velocity is not going to be as large as the force that you had to uh, push at the very, very start. So yeah, um, that's basically the idea here. This G looks terrible, but go work that out for yourselves, and I think uh, hopefully you should find it reasonable.